welcome to session 9 in the first series of the advanced course, The Vital Approach. In this session, we continue our journey through the plant kingdom. We will shed some light on plant families that have the common sensation of being stuck. These are the Cruciferae, the Primulaceae and the Anacardiaceae. How is this expressed in a consultation and how to differentiate between these families? That's what you will find out in this session. Enjoy! This is session 9 in the advanced course, The Vital Approach. In session 8, we talked about plant remedies and we're going to talk about plant remedies more in this session. Last time I told you about the general characteristics of plants and the context of the plant remedies during consultation. We learned there that plants mostly are reactive, reactive to their surroundings, relating to everybody and to you. They give many symptoms, many anecdotes, many modalities, many expressions, many images, many, many of everything. If you ask them a question, they answer with an example and the plant sensation mostly is conveyed to you in very common words and daily expressions that might be considered as level 3 information or escape your attention by the very bulk of information. So there is one more thing now that we have to discuss and it's of major importance to find the exact remedy of the plant family you already have and this is the miasm. In the same way we have for animal kingdom a well-known representative for instance, Lachesis for the snakes and Tarantula for the spiders and Lacanine for the mammals and Falcon or Eagle for the birds. We have for many plant families a well-known member with features that apply to the whole family. For instance, Arnica calendula for the Compositae, Opium for the Papaveracea and um, Staphysaria and Aconite for the Ranunculaceae. But those plant families all have many members and the way to find the right one, uh, the right uh, remedy that your patient needs in the family is by determining his miasm. So now is a good moment to go in details uh, into the miasms. As we know, Hahnemann called his my miasm theory the most important insight or invention of his whole career. This was about two centuries ago. And then nothing was known about bacteria and viruses, or genetics, or psychology. So we have to study our uh, classics, our classic books, and remember the time and the place in uh, which the theories were, uh, were made. So when Hahnemann was uh, working, we're talking about Germany in the late 18th and 19th century. And uh, what he did was, he took the, the, the remedies that were in the official pharmacopoeia of that time and he started to um, experiment with them and he started to dilute them and concuss them, you know, all that and, and uh, make potencies of, of uh, them and, and the tests with those remedies and find that these remedies were more potent as you diluted them more. But the remedies he took were the, the one could say the classical remedies of the pharmacopoeia at that time, at that place. Just imagine that Hahnemann would have been a doctor living in China 500 years ago. Then his pharmacopoeia would have looked completely different and our remedies would have been a completely different set. So there's historical reasons why we have those remedies and why those remedies that are considered uh, polycrests and big remedies and, and deep acting remedies came into our books and the other were a little bit disregarded. Now we would consider the Hahnemannian miasms as constitutional weaknesses or inherited diseases. But at that time, this knowledge wasn't there yet. The followers of Hahnemann added also um, psychological uh, characteristics to the miasms as they were known so far. This was, as you know, Sora, uh, psychosis and syphilis, and they assigned psychological tendencies. So Sora, with all his the, uh, all its deficiencies was considered as a weak, um, uh, timid and fearful uh, personality like the typical Calcarea carbonica as we know it now. Psychosis uh, with all his hyper symptoms and his uh, extra um, 
uh, growths and tendencies is the personality of extremes. And the syphilitic personality was seen as a destructive person. Later, there were uh, combinations of those miasms, the cancer miasm and the tubercular miasm, and they had full proofings with um, mind symptoms and body symptoms and uh, uh, put in rubrics. So until then, uh, or until, until lately, I must say, no zodes, which are the, the remedies with um, characteristics of the core of the disease, were uh, prescribed uh, as either a constitutional remedy or an uh, intercurrent remedy and then mostly when the uh, family diseases were very clear and uh, there were symptoms uh, found in the patient or uh, as a remedy when uh, to deblock a case when well chosen remedies didn't act. And then came Rajat Sankram with his delusional uh, theory, this theory on delusions. And he uh, um, added a whole new um, definition of miasms. Because in his idea, his theory, awareness is cure and delusion is disease, then logically a classification of diseases, which is miasms, is or equals a classification of delusions. What Sankara did was, he used the name uh, and the remedy pictures that were already there and he added the acute to a miasm. He said the acute delusion and the coping up mechanism is also a chronic state if you want, is a, is a way of being. So uh, it is delusional state of the patient and he added it to the already known miasms. So then we had syphilis, psychosis, psora and acute miasm. Mm -hmm. And the cancer and the tubercular, as I told you, are combined miasms between psychosis and syphilis. This means there are a combination of the two. And then Sankran asked himself, if there's a combination possible between those two miasms, are there other combinations possible, maybe between uh, acute and um, sora, or between sora and psychosis? This was his hypothesis, and the answer is yes. So he added a few more miasms. Uh, typhoid miasm between acute and sora, eh? malaria miasm between acute and psychosis, then ringworm miasm between sora and psychosis, and another one between psychosis and syphilis, namely the leprosy miasm. So the chart we have now looks as follows. I will go through it a bit quickly and give you the key keywords. We start from the acute and it goes to the syphilitic miasm, it means from worse to even worse, and from bad to even worse. Uh, the acute miasm we know is uh, reflected in our acute remedies like aconite and belladonna. It is sudden, it is uh, imminent death. Whatever the problem is, because it's a delusion, we're talking of delusions, whatever the problem is, in the patient, the feeling is, the delusion is, it is uh, potentially life-threatening and his reaction to that is um, uh, immediately and it's panic. So it's without thinking, it's without any reflection, it's an immediate reaction and it's a reaction of panic. Whatever he does then or he, he, he pushes somebody to get uh, out of the place where he is, that is the desire to escape from Belladonna, or he just freezes in panic or whatever. It's a panic reaction and it's immediately and it's before thinking. Uh, it, it is acting before reflecting. Then you have uh, typhoid, which is a new one that uh, Sankran added and it is between acute and um, Sora. Now Sora is the beginning, one could say, of all chronicity. And Sora is the symbol of chronicity. That's a, the main invention of Hahnemann. Eh? You have chronic uh, tendencies, underlying tendencies um, that um, are the reason why we see this so-called acute uh, flare-ups of all kinds of diseases. But the ex exciting cause of the maintaining cause better is a, a, a solid chronic, chronic state. Mm -hmm. And so we have this acute state combined with chronicity of Sora. The Sora idea is that with effort you can overcome your problem. 
there is a problem and when you do something then uh, the problem will be uh, will be solved hmm? and there will be a new problem and then the new problem will be solved by a new effort but there is some something hopeful like you can do something about it you have to do something about it but you can do something about it you can solve the problem but it takes effort hmm? and the uh, acute uh, part of the combined um, typhoid myosin is there is a life-threatening situation hmm, and it goes worse, 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 it's building up eh, and it is, has a tendency to chronicity it means and you have to do something very quick otherwise you won't survive. So the feeling is there is a crisis hmm, and the crisis has to be countered by immediate action. Otherwise, the feeling is like your boat is sinking. If you don't do it now, you cannot postpone it uh, for a few weeks. I will solve this problem later. You have to do it now. So the action is uh, shrieking for help and uh, clinging, which we know of all the typhoid mice, uh, remedies. At least it is uh, listed in, for instance, Stramonium or in Luxformica or in Rustox. And many of our well-known remedies are actually shrieking for help. The illusion bed is sinking. Or clinging. All those symptoms um, and characteristics come from our classic rubrics and books. So SORA, we already said, is the model of all chronic diseases. This chronic problem I can overcome very optimistically by effort. The psychotic miasm uh, reflects a fixed problem. It is there and it won't leave you anymore. It's there to stay. The problem is unsolvable, but it is not fatal. So that's the good news. You have it, you will have it forever. The doctor probably will tell you you have to live with it, but you won't die of it. So the action, uh, the, the, how do you say, the coping up mechanism uh, in a psychotic uh, miasm is um, different. You have a few possibilities, let's say. You can hide it, you can deny it, you can accept it, or you can just avoid it. And those are the four words to the patient will use them. The patient in a uh, psychotic miasm state will use either one or all of them mm? because that is how they uh, cope with problems. When something uh, appears, they either accept or resign or they hide or they avoid it. The ringworm miasm is in between Sora and psychosis. It means it has the combined uh, characteristics of both. So the one the one side is the trying, the effort, putting effort in order to solve a problem, to overcome a problem of Sora. So it's trying, 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 doing something. And the other part is resigning. Just accept it. There's nothing I can do about it. Well, that's the way it is. And this uh, alternation between trying, trying, trying and resigning is typical for ringworm. And it's an alternation in periods. It's not that you have it, you know, you give it a try today and you give up in the evening and you give it a try the next morning, yeah, like giving up smoking. Uh, it is more like in periods. Like you have a period where you try to solve your problem and you visit doctors or you take your medication and, and it doesn't help, help very much and then you resign and oh well, you know, you can live with it. It's, it's limiting and it's annoying, but you won't die of it, you know, it's not fatal. Malaria then is the miasm between acute and psychosis. So it has this psychotic feeling of oh, unfortunate. Why me? This problem. Eh? It's so annoying, it's so painful, it's so hindering. Why do I have this? So the feeling I'm unfortunate. And on top of that, you have these acute attacks. It's already bad and then these acute attacks are even worse. Hmm? And the action of malaria uh, the myosin patients is complaining. They don't really do something about it, but, and if they do, they still keep complaining about all the limitations are, how unfortunate they are, are, how much they're hindered by this particular problem, and they can become embittered. It's not always on the foreground, it can be in their dreams, but somewhere you will find hints to the minus. And I've seen several patients who were like, they're not unpleasant patients, that's what I'm trying to say that they didn't have this complaining attitude at all, but in their dreams it was very clear that they felt hindered or stuck or, or unfortunate. Or, and then it was a repetitive, repetitive and clear dreams. Syphilitic miasm we know, 
eh, is a fatal problem. Hmm? There's uh, uh, nothing you can do about it, you know how it will end, it will end in death. Eh? And on top of that, it is unbearable. So it's not that you just wait for the end to come, it's a situation you can't stay in. So you must do something, because you cannot do nothing. But anything you do, whatever you do, won't have any result. So the only thing you're left with is doing something destructive. Nothing will help anyway. And that's why we we'll say, we say uh, syphilitic patients are um, destructive personalities. Uh, for instance, they can drink and become an alcoholic to forget their problems, which won't help much. And that's a, an example of a um, destructive action. You do something, you, of course, every reasonable person knows that it won't solve your problem. At the contrary, it will add a problem on top of it. And still you do it. Hmm? That's a destructive, destructive action of a syphilitic miasm patient. And then we have three miasms in between. We have the cancer miasm, and uh, tubercular and leprosy miasm. All of, of them three have the combination, but they're different. And there's a, a clear way to uh, differentiate and to make a distinction between the one and the other. I found this now, after seeing many, many um, patients, that is quite easy and quite clear. Whereas in the beginning, I was confused and i tell you why. The cancer patient has the feeling, the problem um, could be fatal if things go out of order. If things become chaotic, hmm, then it's potentially fatal. So I have to keep order, everything in its particular place, and that's why they're so-called perfectionists. Perfectionists, which, which there are, because their action is control. I have to control everything, otherwise it tends to, or it could become chaotic, and chaos equals death. So it's a matter of life and death, and it goes on day and night. Because from psychosis on, the problem is always there, whether you have a trigger or not. It's in your mind, and it's with you all of the time. And so the cancer myosin patient is not only fidgety and nervous and perfectionist when there is chaos, he's always like that. He prevents chaos, he's always perfectionist, whether there's somebody there or not. I mean, this is his personality, he doesn't do it in order to please somebody, he has to do it, it's his own condition to be okay. Now the tubercular myosin patient, I found, they have this cancer myosin traits plus. So they have the perfectionism, but they have on top of that the feeling that life is short, I'm burning my candle from two sides, you know, this picture from Viturkas, I have to do something quick because this situation is oppressive and I might suffocate here. I have to change it. Whatever it is, they have to change it. Because change is better than staying. Whatever they do, they might even prefer a change for the worse, because staying here is oppressive and suffocative. So they will um, display a, a, a preference for change. Of course, they, they are grown up, so when they are grown up, they will have all kinds of explanations for that. But you feel there's a need to change, to have no routine, to do different things, um, see many things, come in many places, change many doctors, because change is some kind of a solution. But they do have the perfectionism of cancer as well. That's why you might um, doubt which one does your patient need. He has a very clear perfectionistic tra uh, trace. And also he has this need for change. Well, if they, have, if they have both, it is tubercular, because it's cancer plus. And leprosy myosin, myosin is cancer plus tubercular plus leprosy. So they have the perfectionism, the leprosy myosin patients. They have the need for change and the quick action, the hectic activity of a tubercular patient, and the extra of leprosy myosin. And the extra of leprosy myosin is, is I'm all alone. And I mean literally the feeling I'm all alone in the world because outcasted. That is what is in your books. Outcasted is not wanted, like a leper. We don't want you here. You have to leave us alone and be on your own. It's not wanted or betrayed or not supported by your nearest and dearest. That's the feeling of 
the leprosy, mice and person. There's nobody you can count on, not even your so-called loved ones. So that's one characteristic of the leprosy mice. And the other one is disgust. Now this disgust can be expressed in many ways, but very often it will be um, compensated. Hmm? Or it will only show in dreams. For instance, they dream of disgusting things. Mostly it has something to do with toilets and with uh, faces. So they see dirty toilets or they try to go to the toilet because they have to and they can, know, can find a place where they're in private or where they're uh, at ease. There will always be a, a, a disturbance. The, the door will be too small or there will be no door at all or somebody will walk in or all of a sudden they're exposed in public or they have uh, images of the gutter of, of dirty things but something with toilets with gutter with with waste with uh, what they feel disgusting or they are disgusted by smells and uh, they tend to be the other way around very hygienic they can overdo it in uh, in the opposite uh, endeavor. The same with uh, the feeling of being outcasted and alone and nobody wants you. The action will be, the reaction will be to go to the extremes, to do more than their utter best in order to just be accepted. They won't even say to be loved, but to just be accepted by the others. So they're very high performance. They are super demanding of themselves. And so they can be very hygienic because the basic feeling is disgust with their own uh, excrements and with especially excrements from the others. And they will uh, show the opposite picture very often. And maybe they will have a preference for white, yeah? for white clothes or for white in their surroundings because it's, of course, the image of purity. Now, why is all this important, uh, all this knowledge about my essence. It is important to find the exact member of the family where you got the sensation from in your plant case intake. And, which is very remarkable, I found that in many plant cases the miasm is very clear. Very often it comes in the beginning of the consultation. I don't know why, but that is what I observe. Uh, in contrary to, for instance, animal cases, you have Animal cases where, where you can't find a mice at all and maybe there's an explanation. It's only a theory, but if you consider myism as a coping up mechanism and the animal um, uh, case patient feels, let's say, victimized or inferior to the other, how can you cope up with that? Is that a feeling or is that a sensation you can live with, you can accept, or th there seems no way to, to cope up with it? Hmm? There's no uh, effort that will make you overcome this situation because it's your basic sensation, it's always there. So maybe there is no coping up mechanism in animal remedies. I know in, in books you will find um, for instance, the birds, the insects, the spiders are mostly tubercular. Hmm? According to my understanding, this must be a mistake. Because spiders and um, uh, insects have this speediness and this restlessness and this activity, we say, oh, this must be tubercular. But that is a com uh, confusion between sensations and miasm. It is the basic sensation of those <coughs> Uh, sub-kingdoms. It is not a coping up mechanism. Same with birds. The birds are, have a quick metabolism and they want to feel free. Yeah? But this is not tubercular miasma, it's the bird sensation. And so this is again, I think, a, a, a confounding sensation and miasma. You cannot use the same arguments for both. Hmm? With mammals we see the same. Most mammals are considered to be um, uh, belonging to the leprosy myasm because they have the feeling of being despised and be dirty and, and, and ugly but this is a, a mammal sensation it is not a coping up mechanism of uh, the myasm so again it's, a, it's using the same arguments for both sensation and myasm which I don't think is right 
my advice is, in animal cases, for the time being, forget about my essence because they are not a help. If they don't help us, only confuse us, then for the time being, I say, we might forget about it until we have a better uh, theory. In mineral cases, again, very often the myosin is not very clear. Sometimes it is, and uh, from some uh, mineral remedies, we know the myosin. Eh? We know that sulfur is considered as a, the, the number one soric remedy, and alumina is um, a syphilitic remedy, and, and aurum is a syphilitic remedy. But a lot of other remedies we don't know very well to which remedy they belong. And if you see the charts going from right to left, from acute to uh, syphilitic, it doesn't seem to fit. And on top of that, we don't need it. Because in your chart, your periodic table, you have 18 stages, which is more fine-tuning actually than the myosins. And this will help us more to determine the right remedy, the stage the patient is in, uh, um, in this particular sensation, than the miasmatic characteristics which are unclear.